Okay, shall we continue? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Miodrag Jovanovic, and I will continue the second part of this first panel. Uh, Professor Dragica Vojadinović, uh, through a large meal of concepts uh, in front of you, so my lecture will be a very small side dish, a salad, so to speak, in comparison to what she has to uh, say about this whole topic. So I have to make first a uh, couple of caveats or disclaimers, so to speak. First of all, I'm not a die-hard believer of the gender mainstreaming of the entire legal world, which is Dragica's idea. Uh, so I came uh, here mostly due to the fact that she uh, manages to involve me in all her projects. But uh, since I'm here, I wanted to scrutinize some uh, very basic issues. As you will see, I will, I will try to scrutinize the, the very uh, title of this uh, Spring School or the Future Master Program, uh, or the, the shortcut for the entire thing, Low Jam and to see what we are speaking about, basically, when we are speaking about law jam. Which brings me to the second point. I'm a legal philosopher, and I guess in all languages, when you say to someone, don't philosophize much, that usually has a connotation that somebody is trying to perplex things, to make them more complex than they are. But uh, we are doing here philosophy in a completely, with a completely different idea in mind to try to make things as clear as possible. Uh, so I will try to make uh, things as clear as possible, at least with this one, maybe minor, but a very particular topic, which you can see... Uh, uh, on your screens with a question mark so I don't have a final answer to this I call you to discuss the topic with me uh, I will suggest some sort of a conclusion but it's far from a definite conclusion and I'm completely uh, open uh, to discussion and actually I'm I would very much welcome that you participate and to uh, try together with me uh, to entangle this, uh, disentangle this, uh, this problem. I also assume, which is not probably uh, a valid assumption, that majority of people who attend this course are lawyers. So probably here everyone comes with a uh, from a legal background, but I don't know about our online participants. Uh, to a certain extent, this the topic, uh, the way how I frame this topic, uh, in a way uh, favors this a uh, legal point of view or legal angle. But uh, I will try to to show you that. Uh, this is not necessarily so that there is uh, the question that which is open to, to uh, or can be put uh, from, uh, from the perspective of non-lawyers as well, non-lawyers who are willing to, to attend this course and to participate in this course. So, uh, here is a very uh, brief uh, structure of this uh, talk or this lecture and I will uh, try to be as short as possible in order to uh, provide some space for for discussion even though we do we do have uh, uh, one final kind of uh, uh, panel for discussion so I will start first with the question how to characterize this discipline uh, and then I will focus on the 
question and that's the reason why I said I kind of favored the legal point of view or legal uh, angle whether we can speak of law and gender or alternative gender law as a special uh, branch of law uh, and then I will try to figure out whether there is enough material here in Serbian law to speak about uh, gender law as a branch of law but the test that I will try to uh, device is basically a general abstract analytical test so it can be used for any jurisdiction so you can use it uh, to test it for French law or US law or whatever for whatever legal system and then I will uh, come up with a couple of uh, concluding assessments which as I said are not uh, conclusive and they are completely open to to discussion so at some point I was uh, I was kind of puzzled with this uh, law gem acronym and I uh, asked myself asked myself what is the relation between law and gender in this acronym law gem mean M is obviously for the uh, master program so uh, there are obviously two possibilities uh, first we may speak about law and gender or gender law just like we speak like law and contracts and torts or we speak about criminal law that's one possibility and then there is another possibility we may speak about law and gender which is similar to disciplines like law and society law and religion and there are other uh, disciplines of this kind uh, and I have to make a immediate uh, remark that conceptually speaking it is not unconceivable to have both of these disciplines to have uh, for instance law and economy as one discipline and to have economic law as a parallel parallel existing discipline so what are your initial thoughts on this did you think of that at all if you didn't it's not a problem now I'm kind of raising this issue so initially what what would you go for and why obviously as I said no right answers obviously so just go ahead with with your uh, initial comments and uh, of course when I s the the this call is open also to to our online participants as well so please go ahead uh, freely uh, come up with with any uh, intuitive hunches yes please just use your microphone yes uh, for me at at the first view I'd say that um, law on gender or I'd say gender law is actu actu actually more uh, ha has more practical use than uh, law and gender it sounds more uh, theoretical so I would uh, emphasize the importance of gender law because we have many situations to to look from uh, as a lawyer pers pers uh, perspective so just a clarification uh, you are now speaking about do you think you you come to the gender law course or you come to a law and gender course and why why do you think either of those things uh, I guess I came to both no <laughs> to both <laughs> yes please I have to disagree with this uh, law on gender because it's for me it's law and gender because uh, as we say law on gender is specialized on something more 
concrete, but when, it's, when we say law and gender, we say law, uh, gender in all aspects of law, not only gender, law and gender, but if you understand what is my... Mm, <laughs> not quite. Uh, because... Okay. Uh, yes, a law and gender... Jackets agrees with you, that, that's important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but please try to convince me, since I'm now... Okay, like so we have, the, the uh, for example, criminal law that consists of some gender agenda in the law, when, it's made, mm -hmm. when, it's law, when the law is made. But when, it, when, when we say law and gender, we mean like in every aspect of not only criminal law, not only labor law, not only uh, public law, but in all spheres of law as... You can find gender-related legal provisions. Yes, in every Why aspect. Why that would not be enough to have gender law? Uh, yes, something like that. No, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the question for you. For me. Why, why that would not be enough to have gender law? Because it's very complex. It's not only, we cannot combine it in one, for me it's in every, it's as uh, Professor Dagita mentioned, it's intersectional, it's everywhere. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. okay. I'd have to disagree with you, sorry. <laughs> um, I'd rather go with the first one because I think that gender and law have that, they're inextricably linked. So when we talk about law, as one of the main tenets of law is that is like based on both genders. So I think that's why gender law um, kind of makes more sense because when I hear law and gender, it's like two different things rather than gender law kind of applies, I think, more to your idea that it's all types of law, but then like a gender kind of point to you. So I'd rather say it is gender law. I think it makes more sense as it is two separate terms that coexist that they have to exist like in one term in order to kind of emphasize what gender law is about. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, as I said, it is not inconceivable at all to have both disciplines. So, of course you can. But just to, to let students... Know. This is also the question for you. Because yeah, okay, okay. Just... just okay, okay. So I think that first uh, uh, Professor Mildrak owes us additional cl clarification for what he means with this gender law because it can That's mean... That's my entire lecture, Dragice. Uh, no, 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 but in order that they can uh, think about and give their opinion, they have to know whether you thought, uh, you meant gender law, it can have di two different opposite meanings. Gendered law, feminist critique, speaks about gendered law, the law which covers, hides uh, male dominance. And uh, gender, uh, gender, law, gender perspective in law, I don't know how to, how to pronounce, how to name okay. that. So, so either gendered law, or gender, gender law, meaning gender perspective in law. Uh, that is what the colleague, understood, how he understood you. Yeah, okay, but... And gendered the, the law is something what I had to add to this discussion in order to make things more clear for... No, no, it's, uh, I mean, at this point, it's really important what are their hunches about this. I will just go with the analysis of my analysis obviously it's not something that you have to agree with uh, but that's just the, the point of the entire lecture is to to go through uh, uh, through these different possibilities I'm just now interested in what are your initial thoughts mm -hmm. so obviously you will throughout the lecture you will have uh, more time to think of it and to reflect on on the, the dilemma so maybe by the end of the lecture some of you you will uh, in a way, change their their perspective. Uh, Mila wants uh, wanted to. Yes. Initially, I thought that just both terms. You, uh, okay. Uh, so initially, I thought that both terms can be used uh, parallelly in this lecture. But since we are on the Faculty of Law and we are studying law. I would opt for the first one, so gender law as a part of the law, which core is 
gender relations and how law can influence them or make them more fair, for example. So we can have both, but since we are applying law on the first place regarding gender relations, I would opt for a first option. Okay. Yes, please. Should I, yeah. As probably the only one who's not coming from legal background, I'm a historian, so I'm okay. from Faculty of Philosophy. I would opt for both versions because for me they make sense. First one is more legal, more legally theoretical and applicable to legal theory. Second one is more applicable to uh, historical trajectories. So I would opt for in any, any approach to historical perspectives on gender and law, I would opt for the second version and say law and gender. So it basically, it basically, it basically moves us from uh, presentism and from contemporaneity of law into the longer historical tra trajectories. So that is my, my vision. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Yes, please. Uh, well, I would go with the second option, that is law and gender, because uh, gender law or law on gender suggests that law should regulate gender, which is not really the case here. And also when we say law and gender, gender is a separate category which can exist without law present, but it has a certain connection between the two and they affect each other. So law and gender just shows us that those are two separate fields which are in certain correlation, while gender law seems to me like something that we can maybe see in some areas of law, but not in a degree high enough for us to call it a separate discipline or field. So I would go with just law and gender for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There was a hand on the... Well, I would go for uh, law and gender because gender, as colleague said, is not legal but meta-legal institution and term, and there is no uh, le uh, legal differentia specifica, unlike uh, marriage, uh, uh, felony, uh, torts, or constitution in that term, because gender is regulated or should be regulated by every area of law or entire legal uh, order of the country. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Any other comment? Yes, please, Anna. Uh, yes, I would agree with colleagues and I would opt for law and gender. And when I say that I would opt for law and gender, for me it means that I would take gender consideration in all parts of law. So for example, if we talk about refugee law, we see that women, uh, for example, have different, uh, different uh, they need different interpretations of law and having this gender, uh, gender sensitive approach. So we can also, and I think that we will cover separate topics about having gender uh, through all areas of law, especially because when we talk about international law, we can say that some breaches of, of international law uh, were interpreted through male perspectives. So here we want to have women's pers or gender perspective, and we do not want to have separate rights. So it's not another breach of law, but it's uh, having all gender in different aspects. Thank you. Okay. Incidentally, that's also the right answer because the spring school is called law and gender, <laughs> starting from our first school. Thank you, thank you, dear Professor Spice, for for solving this mystery. Actually, I'm not opposing to law and gender <laughs> at all. So, uh, as I said, that's the reason why I put that. Uh, we are not speaking about inconceivable things. Uh, obviously, we can have, uh, conceptually, we can have uh, both courses. And it's just important to know what one course implies and what the other course implies. That's very important to begin with. Uh, and as I will try to show what the, what's the reason and what is the 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 uh, the logic between uh, behind my question of uh, characterization of, of disciplines. So why characterize disciplines at all? Uh, 
and then I will just try to uh, figure out whether uh, there is enough ground to speak of something which can be labeled uh, gender law or law on gender. Uh, and not in a sense that was mentioned by Dragica by the uh, label gendered law because this is a completely different aspect. It's a kind of uh, the critical uh, jurisprudence or critical uh, approach to law. I'm here speaking about the possibility of uh, speaking of the separate kind of professional uh, specialization which can be called uh, gender law or law and gender which can lead to a class of lawyers that perceive themselves as gender lawyers like you have international lawyers like you have criminal lawyers like you have European lawyers so that's my kind of the focus and as I said this does not uh, exclude in any way the possibility of having a separate discipline which can go far beyond uh, the insistence on the valid legal provisions uh, which cover gender in whatever aspect but ask uh, about some of the relations which uh, go into the areas of uh, politics or political concepts and you could hear a number of different concepts that were raised in, in Dragica's uh, lecture like just a one analogy uh, we have here an electoral course uh, which uh, covers the rules, legal rules on election. And election is obviously a concept that goes beyond merely legal rules and implies a number of different aspects that are covered by political uh, science, or political theory, political philosophy, or economy, or sociology, or various other disciplines, including aspects of feminist political theory as well, which can, uh, problemat uh, which can problem problematize the concept of citizens, for instance, or the concept of uh, some of the aspects of, of uh, electoral process, from the feminist perspective. So, uh, why characterization in the first place? Uh, there is a, first of all, personal perspective. And that's what I, that's what I ask uh, some of you. So what was your perception when applying to this course? Uh, did you want to specialize some subject? Or you wanted to broaden the scope of your knowledge. These are quite two different goals, two different uh, aims of uh, participating in some uh, scholar scholarly activity. Then you have a perspective of the very educational institution because educational institution should provide an adequate form of the transfer of knowledge depending whether it wants to specialize some area of study or broaden some area of study and in that sense this school it's not summer but we are almost today temperature was close to summer so summer school and master program they are completely different educational forms of knowledge transfer. Completely different. Because master program is usually structured as some form of specialization of study. So when you 
go for a master in, I don't know, consumer law, you want to specialize in the area of law which is now somehow recognized as a consumer law, which was not the case like 20 years ago when I started to study, which was more than 20 years ago. Uh, there was no such thing as consumer law. No such thing. There was not a subject. There was not a course in, in, the, in our curriculum which was called consumer law. So as we will see, branches of law, they emerge, they uh, disappear. So it's a, it's a dynamic life of branches of law, not only branches of law, but also legal concepts. Uh, whereas when, when you apply for a certain summer school, it may also uh, bring you kind of a broadening of your knowledge in certain in certain area in certain field and finally uh, from a perspective of the respective professional community as i said just uh, before i put this slide on uh, it can make a profoundly uh, a big difference if there is a new field of professional specialization like gender lawyers. Uh, since most of you are lawyers, in a more, uh, even here, even here in our small uh, professional lawyers community, where most of the lawyers do not have the uh, capacity to specialize in certain field and to just practice one area of law, that's really a kind of a privileged position of a of a, mi a minority of lawyers but even here uh, you know for certain lawyers oh they are like civil lawyers or they are criminal lawyers or they practice uh, company law or they are specialized in uh, international arbitration or so on and so forth so uh, in a more advanced legal surroundings you would had uh, you have a, 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 a different forms of the kind of lifelong learning or lifelong uh, education of, of lawyers in certain spe specialized fields of law with new advancements with new changes in law and then you will have certain kind of uh, additional uh, labeling and certain additional uh, benefits if you for instance specialize in this field then you will you will have a kind of official label he is a specialized in this or that area of law so it's very potentially very important if we are speaking of something which can lead to a new category of lawyers which will call themselves uh, gender gender lawyers uh, so in order to emphasize this, I will, I will give you, I will give you uh, an example. And example concerns uh, the community of European lawyers. Uh, when I say European lawyers, I mean lawyers who are specialized in European law, meaning European Union law. European Union law. So... Uh, the story of the of strengthening of european union law is very much tied to to some episodes in which european court of justice which is now called court of justice of the european union managed to uh, hand over some very important crucial decisions in the mid 60s uh, in very unfavorable circumstances in which nobody would have expected that European court could do such thing. In a way, this was, uh, I don't want to go into details of European Union law, but in a way, some of the decisions, these early decisions uh, of the European Court of Justice uh, were kind of perceived as a big bang 
of the creation of the European Union law. And one big puzzle behind this episode is how this was possible in the first place. Having in mind that up to that point everything was in the hands of the member states, of the national states, national courts, and basically European Court of Justice did not do much in the first years of its existence. And one of the answers, very interesting, but to my mind very plausible answers, was exactly the rise of the awareness of a certain group of lawyers that perceive themselves as European lawyers, as lawyers practicing European Union law, of course, including judges of the European Court of Justice, and some of the lawyers within the member states of uh, European Union they managed somehow within the closed circle of professional community to somehow give a boost to the rise of this uh, uh, the rise of European Union law. Of course the story is not that simple but it just shows you how important is the creation of professional community of lawyers that are connected by their shared interest. And the same goes uh, for international lawyers also. There were, it, it is also witnessed in one great book on how international law managed to rise at a certain point in 19th century, basically, that it was very much due to the fact that first societies of international lawyers were created and that the awareness that we are doing the same thing, practicing international law, was somehow kind of the buzzword or the code, the code word among themselves. Okay. Uh, so as I said, I will be interested in one particular question. Can we speak about gender law? And there are two interrelated yet separate issues that has to be that have to be addressed here first whose task is to acknowledge the status of a specialized disciplinary field here we were giving our uh, kind of random answers but does this count is it relevant uh, who should have a final say do we have anyone who should have a final say on the question whether do we have or do or we do not have something called gender law and then upon which criteria is it possible credibly to speak about law and gender that is gender law so i will speak only gender law but as i said uh, these are interchangeable two phrases so whose task let me give you three possible actors who can contribute to uh, deciding on this issue. Uh, first one is a state. And I will immediately uh, say that state less directly contributes to the systematization of various legal provisions into some distinctive disciplinary units. To a, to a certain extent, it does. For instance, if we have criminal law or the criminal code, then it goes almost naturally that we will have an area of law, branch of law, which is called criminal law. And uh, the same goes, for instance, uh, with the example that I mentioned. If we have a, a law on consumer protection, then it's obviously something which may more credibly lead to the claim that we have something called consumer law. Uh, then there is also an additional element uh, in the 
institutional division of labor. So if you have criminal courts, if you have administrative courts, then obviously you can more easily speak about administrative law. Or if you have uh, commercial courts, you can more easily speak about commercial law. Uh, then there is an additional moment, which is not the same in all countries, but at least in Serbia, uh, state does prescribe which disciplinary areas shall be passed at the bar exam. This is very important. This is almost crucial for the for the realization, for the uh, formation of a certain branch, branch of law. Even though this could not, and then you, you have the same thing, uh, you have the same thing, uh, I mean, you have the replication of that, uh, of that model within the uh, curricula of the law faculties. So law faculties are the, the second actor who can here contribute with the uh, possible systematization of legal, legal branches or legal uh, disciplines. Uh, so, for instance, uh, as you all know, at the law faculty, University of Belgrade, all areas that are provided by the state to be passed at the bar exam are compulsory courses at the law faculty. That's not a coincidence, obviously. Even though these, no, these do, do not uh, necessarily overlap. So, for instance, you have uh, the uh, intellectual property law as a compulsory course, and intellectual property law is not uh, obligatory at the bar exam. So you have, you have some uh, minor... Uh, uh, differences in terms of the structure of those courses which are uh, uh, provided by the law faculties in their curricula and the uh, bar exam uh, requirements of the law. And finally, there is the role of legal science, that is legal scholarship. Uh, Legal scholarship or legal science is the one which has to, based on what it finds in the current curricula of law faculties, in the current legislation of the state, but also with some additional uh, arguments and tools, provide some sort of systematization of disciplines because by the end of the day as you all know there is no such thing as uh, a legal provision of different areas of law there is no such thing you cannot find in any legal uh, document any sort of uh, kind of division between different legal disciplines per se so I will start exactly with uh, what legal science or legal scholarship uh, does, and I will use uh, one framework which was provided by uh, one uh, famous uh, legal scholar, Radomir Lukic. But uh, this is very, very similar to what, what you can find in other uh, in other writings of different legal scholars, so it's not kind of uh, revolutionary, new or different. It's just one very convenient systematization in order for you to more easily come to the uh, topic of our today's lecture. So he perceives legal system as a logically ordered, non-contradictory set of general legal norms. This is what most lawyers do. It's our perception that legal norms are ordered in that way, even though we all know, especially if we are in legal practice, 
that they are far from ordered, that they are far from inconsistent, that they are far from uh, well-structured, and so on and so forth. So it just, we operate as if they are so. And when put in bottom-up order, elements of the legal system are the following. At the most basic level, we have legal concepts. Legal concepts are usually uh, covered by, or they are composed of uh, several legal pro provisions that regulate, that refer to one and the same social relationship. So we have inheritance, for instance, or we have adoption, or we have negligence, or we have election, and so on and so forth. So uh, each of these legal concepts, they cannot be uh, kind of, uh, 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 they can, they are not found in a single legal provision, but there is always a couple of legal provisions that refer to this legal concepts. Uh, then we have legal branches. So a set of several legal concepts that regulate a number of related types of social relationships. So family law, criminal law, consumer law, and so on. Uh, then we go to the highest level and we speak of legal fields. This is one uh, possible uh, kind of division which provides uh, four dichotomies, municipal and international law, public-private law, material procedural law, and state and autonomous law. Uh, and we can go even uh, further beyond that and we can speak about families of legal systems, common law, civil law, sharia law, oriental law, and so on and so forth. Uh, so obviously gender law cannot be a single legal concept, uh, concept and it cannot be uh, a legal field. So it can be this middle range concept it can be the branch of law or as two authors that I use their kind of analog uh, analytical framework, they speak of area of law, chitin and steel. They speak of areas of law. Uh, it's completely identical to branches of law. And in their opinion, the area of law is uh, a subset of legal norms in the system. That's first thing, which is completely uncontroversial. And then, which is intersubjectively recognized by the legal complex in that system as a subset of such <laughs> norms. So obviously, uh, there are two, at least two things that are here uh, not clarified enough. What, what is legal complex and what is intersubjective recognition? So these two things we need to clarify in order to see uh, whether we can come up with, uh, with some sort of answer to this, uh, to this question. Uh, so recognition of an area of law has to be based on something. It's not enough if we find some legal provision. So, in, so for instance, there is no such thing as Sunday law. You can find anywhere anybody speaking about Sunday law, even we can find legal provisions which regulate certain activities on Sunday, saying, okay, elections shall be on Sunday, or all shops shall be closed on Sunday, and so on and so forth. But there is no such thing as Sunday law. So it's not enough if we somewhere find the word gender, okay, here is a gender, Thus, we have a gender <coughs> law. That's obviously not enough. Uh, legal complex. These are their words. But it's, I will not read it. It's quite, it's quite clear. In order for something to be recognized as an area of law, basically you need to have a rather large consensus 
of different, of different actors within legal community, meaning legal scholars, uh, judges, prosecutors, uh, notaries, uh, legal solicitors, uh, those who are involved in uh, other areas, for instance, in publishing law journals, in organizing law conferences, and so on and so forth. So you have to have a, a rather large recognition within a society of, respective society of lawyers. Uh, so intersubjective means that it's not enough that if we hear at the law faculty say, okay, we want to have, this will call, we will call it gender law, we, we have gender law, and it's enough for gender law to exist. If nobody in the bar association, if the, in the judiciary, among the judges, among the prosecutors, see this as a meaningful thing. Also, what, are, what the heck are you talking about? There's no such thing as gender law. So it's not enough. It's not enough. So it has to be some sort of a shared acceptance. But when do we'll, we will have this kind of a tipping point, it's obviously not possible to answer in advance in an abstract terms. So we have to put ourselves in some concrete occasions and to ask whether we, whether we have some sort of intersectional acceptance. Uh, as I said, legal scholarship is uh, potentially in the best position. It's best equipped to perform this analytical task of systematiza systematization. But on the other hand, it can do so only by relying on legal practice. We are obliged by the legal practice. If there is no law saying anything about gender, then there is no uh, really ground for legal theory in Serbia or legal scholarship in Serbia to speak about gender law. It's very diffi uh, difficult to do so. Uh, but here is also one important caveat. Nothing prevents legal scholarship for, tr uh, uh, for trying to promote, to inaugurate an area of law by developing a classification system of norms that is not already in existence. So, for instance, nobody can prevent Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, to have a course called Gender Law, obviously. It's within the autonomy of the law school to come up with some such course. But whether this will be enough for Gender Law to exist <coughs> in Serbia as a branch of law, it's quite the other question, it's a the question which requires this intersectoral acceptance by other actors in the, uh, in the society. So what are the possible criteria? This is the, the second question that we have. Uh, I will just briefly uh, mention this because I'm running out of time. Uh, four minutes, four minutes? Boyan took me three and you took me two, so, oh. okay. Oh, yes, and, and we started five minutes late. Okay. No, it's okay. I, I will try to, to finish. So, uh, usually regulatory object or a purpose or a procedure, something of, of these uh, criteria are used uh, for the classification of a certain uh, branch of law as a, as a distinctive, as a separate uh, branch of law. Uh, so, is law and gender, or gender law, a, br a branch of, or area of Serbian law? Or as I said, everything that I said so far can be applied to any jurisdiction. Uh, the question 
has to be answered based on what I call here raw legal material. Raw legal material means do we have some legal provision, provisions? Do we have some legislation? Do we have core decisions? Do we have courses on law faculties? Do we have conferences on the topic? Do we have publications that kind of uh, mention or use uh, this gender law uh, phrase? Uh, and obviously, is there, is there enough evidence of this intersubjective recognition? As for the first question, I will now just go through some of the examples without discussing them, but we can uh, turn to this, uh, to this. First of all, we have a separate Gender Equality Act, which was enacted in 2021, so it's a rather recent phenomenon. So, for instance, Article 3 speaks about gender equality and what gender equality implies. Obviously, that's a very significant kind of piece of uh, raw legal material from our uh, jurisdiction. Uh, Article 6 speaks, uh, uh, it's an interpretative provision and it's, uh, it defines what is gender and what is sex. Uh, we will not have now the time for, for discussion, whether uh, you agree or disagree, that's obviously one of the intriguing questions. Uh, but then we have Prohibition of Discrimination Act, which was uh, initially uh, drafted in 2009 and amended it uh, 2021. And there are several uh, gender rel uh, relevant provisions. Uh, and I mentioned some of them, uh, or. Uh, article 20 uh, in particular. Then there is Register of Births, Births Act, uh, which was also drafted in 2009 but amended in 2014 and 18. And there is one important article, 45B, which states that in the Register of Births, information about the change of sex is entered based on the decision of the competent administrative authority, which is adopted on the basis of the prescribed certificate of the competent health institution. That's very important provision. And this provision was the result of one groundbreaking decision of the Constitutional Court of Serbia back in 2011, in which uh, the court stated that the constitutional appeal of X is approved and it is established that the municipal administration of muni municipality Z, by reaching a conclusion of actual lack of jurisdiction, failed to decide on the request of the applicant of the constitutional appeal to change that data on sex and thus violated his right to dignity and free personal development and so on and so forth. So this was really, really important uh, constitutional court decision. So as you can see, uh, there are quite a few provisions, uh, some very important judicial decisions. One can come up with other uh, examples of judicial provisions as well, judicial decisions as well. But what about other actors? The record regarding the science of recognition is rather mixed. As far as I can tell, legal practice is rarely, if ever, referring to a distinctive area of law under this label. I have never heard anyone speaking about gender law. And then we have uh, quite a number of things happening under the, the leadership of Dragica. So if we manage to bring gender law, it's definitely because of uh, her endeavors. Uh, there is a course called Gender Studies. This is a, a description of the course which I took from the official web page. And it obviously it's, it's, uh, uh, it's structured more as a law and gender course. It's more wide. Uh, and all this lead me to some conclusions or uh, I will list them. Uh, first of all, I would say that the studies in this area is in a 
peculiar disciplinary state of flux, meaning we cannot quite be determined uh, on the question whether uh, such thing as gender law or not. Uh, obviously, everything which is done here, not only here at this course, but generally uh, uh, like book series with Springer or international conferences or uh, other books that are published by by our colleagues, uh, we can see that there are a lot of efforts in the direction of inaugurating an area of law called gender law here at the law faculty. But as I said, the ultimate success will depend on the response from other areas of this legal complex, from legal practice more, uh, more particularly. And if you ask me, there is no such critical mass at the current moment. Uh, no circle of lawyers who would nowadays think of, the, of themselves as gender lawyers. But when Dragica established master course, everything will be changed and we'll have the first generation of master lawyers and that will, that will change things, change the game entirely. And I will end here. Thank you. So the break, the break will be until uh, quarter, 15 minutes. So it's now it is six, th three, four, seven, four, but 15 minutes. So we'll, we will start at 7.20. 7 20. Okay.